This week's edition of NJBIA's Minding Your Business is brought to you in part by AT&T, helping family, friends, and neighbors connect in meaningful ways every day. PPAC Gladstone Bank, known nationally and in New Jersey for providing unparalleled client service, integrity, and trust for over 100 years. New Jersey's community colleges, aligning education to build an innovative workforce. Find out how your business can benefit at njpathways.org. And by New Jersey Business Magazine, providing critical information needs for New Jersey's business community for more than 66 years. Welcome to NJBI's Mind Your Business, I'm Bob Considine. Well, as part of her Year of the Business Owner Tour, NJBI President and CEO Michelle Sakurka visited another one of our member businesses making a difference. The Dance Center in South Toms River is one of the state's premier dance studios, and as we learned from owner Sherry Dackness, this is a business that is needed to improvise both on and off the floor. Have a look. Sherry, it is so great to be here with you today. Um, let's, let's take a step back and please tell me all about the history of the Dance Center. And it's a family-run business, so tell me about your parents who started it. So my parents, Richard and Elizabeth Dosher, started um, the Dance Center back in 1982. So uh, they ran it for the first 34 years. And I took it over at that point when they were ready to retire and we are now on our 41st season. Um, we have been in the town of South Toms River for all of that time, and um, they've been extremely supportive of our business. So I wanna just give a little shout out to them for always being there for the business. That's wonderful. Your passion, where does that come from that you decided you wanted to continue and be second generation for the dance center? Well, <laughs> my, my, I've always grown up dancing. So I've been dancing since I was two. And um, my whole family dances. My sister, all my sisters are a part of it. Um, and I have just never been able to leave that behind. When I went to college, I majored in nursing and um, was never able to leave dance behind. So even in nursing school, I was still trying to teach classes and then going into the city to take classes myself. And whatever classes that Rutgers would allow me to take, not being a full dance major. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's in my blood, I guess you could say. So it's one thing to have the passion in your blood for the actual art of dance, right? How did you then take that and say, now I wanna run a business? That was sort of um, unexpected, an unexpected change, because as I said, I was in nursing, but I was still always teaching at least two, three nights a week, um, which I just love being in the classroom. That is my favorite part. The business part was definitely a big step in a different direction for me, which was definitely a learning curve. There was a lot that I didn't know that I had to learn. So I took a lot of classes, tried to get myself a little get bit educated and prepare for that end of the business. But no matter what happens, I'd still, in a million years, rather be in the classroom <laughs> teaching than doing the actual business end of the business. Sure. But unfortunately, that is a necessity in order to, to be able to have the business running and continuing in my family's name. You know, and that's actually the biggest challenge we see for small business owners, right, is that their passion comes from the art, whatever that art may be, the product that they're making, the service they're delivering, and then they have to translate that into running the business. So now you're wearing three or four different hats because you want to stay in the classroom. You want to be boots on the ground, as we call it, right? Close to the students because that's what really gives you the thrill. But you still have to keep the roof over the head. Correct, correct. And that I find personally has the biggest challenge because I know that I've had to hire more staff in order to fill some of the areas that I would normally be doing um, myself teaching. So I've, and I've kind of like honed in on the kind of things that I am teaching that I love the most and had to let some of the extras go in order for me to, you know, get the most out of, out of being in the classroom. 
So where we're sitting right now, um, this is a rather large facility, multiple rooms, a lot of activity. Um, but there was a even more humble beginning before this, right, which is right across the street. So now take me on the journey of how you make the decision to leave the safe space of the smaller building um, and really take that jump to grow the business. So the first two years, I would say, when I took over the business for um, my parents, um, I made a lot of changes. We were literally diagonally across the street on Route 9 um, next to the Sundays and the Beachcomber. Um, and my parents were renting all of that time from Frank Brady, who was absolutely wonderful. Um, but we were starting to outgrow that three-room space. Um, we we're also starting to outgrow that ceiling height because um, our tumbling program was so large. And then I also introduced um, circus arts, so aerial silks, trapeze, lira, which require a much bigger ceiling height than what was uh, available at our current space. So we looked around, a couple buildings fell through. Um, this piece of property, which actually used to be an old bank at one point in time, became available we ended up having to um, take down that building and then build the warehouse in order to accomplish what we needed to do. And once again, many thanks to the town of South Tom's River for helping us get that through and done in the middle of COVID. Yeah, and we're gonna come back to COVID in a minute. So a lot of investment though, um, to, to bring this building to life. And I think you mentioned um, SBA loan? Yes, so as a, uh, as a woman and a first time business owner, I was able to get an SBA loan um, in order to put this whole building together. Of course, we had to do some personal investment as well, but the SBA loan, without that, we would not have been able to build the state-of-the-art facility that you're in today. So now let's go back to timing. <laughs> timing is everything in life, <laughs> yes. right? So you were in the process of building this building right when COVID hit. Yes, so we made the final purchase in October, I guess, of 2019. Mm -hmm. And then um, we started, you know, demoing the other building in that December of 2019. And then March came and it was shut down. So thankfully we had our steel already, which was really helpful. Um, so the process was much slower and longer than it would have been and much more expensive than we anticipated because all the prices shot up with COVID for building materials delivery and of materials was a challenge, actually getting the materials on hand, and then also getting the, the people from the town who were working mostly remotely to be able to come in and do the inspections. That's where the town of Toms River really, um, South Toms River really came in. That's great to hear because oftentimes we hear where that can be a challenge. And so it's wonderful to hear that your local municipality was here to help you through that through that process. And I'm gonna take a guess that that's because you're pretty engaged in your community and have great relationships in your community. Yes, we, we try to do as many local events as we can between Tom's River, South Tom's River, um, the downtown Tom's River um, does a lot of local festivals. So we usually do some performances there they usually they reach out to us and they're like, oh, we're gonna have a like a harvest fest is one of them, or they'll have um, like there's a winter festival and we'll come in and we'll do a performance at those. Macaroni Kids is a fantastic organization and we do a lot of events with them. Uh, they have a magazine which explains kids' events and things like that. They've been fantastic as well. So you were talking about the fact that all the pricing went up in order to complete this project. What did that feel like? Scary. <laughs> That's the best word uh, for it. Um, building in the time of COVID, it was kind of like, okay, well, do we just not do this? Because we know the prices are going up, the challenge of getting the materials. Um, it was definitely very scary. And um, I, I think really the drive for keeping my family business going after all this time was what really pushed me through making sure we were gonna survive this. And we literally used as many resources as we can. We had the original SBA loan that we received, um, you know, as a woman business owner to actually put the building together. Um, throughout COVID, we were able to obtain the two um, PPP loans. 
which is what helped me employ and pay my staff during that time. I didn't have to let a single of my 16 staff members go during That's COVID. That's fantastic. They all worked remotely. Um, there may be some cut in hours, but at least there was some money coming in for them. So everybody was able to still continue their role. So let me ask you, some people would say, you know, it's dance, it's a kid's extracurricular activity, but here you are in the middle of COVID, really going to the nth degree to make sure you can keep your workforce on, right? And you can mm -hmm. continue to deliver your product and service because you didn't have your, your workforce just here to be here. Why was it so important to you to ensure that those activities continued for those students at that time? A lot of the, uh, that time was very difficult for students because they felt very isolated. And even if being on Zoom was, you're still in your own home, you were still like seeing everybody on the screen. So it was a way for them to connect with their friends. It was a way for them to have a sense of normalcy yeah. when all normalcy was taken away from them. And that was so important to the mental health of so many kids, much more than I think a lot of people even understood. I've had multiple parents thank me for everything that was going on, uh, you know, still trying running the program during COVID because they would tell me that's the only thing that their child had to look forward to. So let's carry that forward um, because again, there's this perception sometimes of, you know, dance and you know, who, who, one out of 100 are gonna grow up to be a dancer. And so kids don't, students don't just come here to become professional dancers, right? What other skills, competencies do they build and why is that so important for their future? The one main skill that I think that a lot of the, the newer workforce is missing today would be teamwork and how to work as a team and how to work together and be productive. It's not always about I, me, you know, what, what I can do in my own personal gain. Um, when you are in a dance class and when you're working with a team of other dancers, there's lifts, there's partner work, there's all kinds of things that need to come together. And even if just one of those team members is not doing what they need to do, the whole team is affected. So that is an extremely valuable skill that they learn, um, you know, working as a team together and how important every person's role is, and that it's not just the star. Everybody plays an important part in making the team work. Students learn discipline because, say, you come to ballet class, you have to be in uniform. So if you come in not in uniform and not with your hair up in your bun, then there are consequences to that, as in you have to go home or you need to come back in and um, go into the bathroom and change into your proper uniform. So those people who grow up and have to go to work in a uniform, they know what that's like and that it's important. They also learning respect by coming into class on time, by coming into class in their proper uniform, and by not being, you know, not talking out of turn in class, making sure you address the teacher with respect all the time, wait for the teacher, raise your hand if you have a question, those kind of things. The little kids, um, when they come here, will do multiple subject type of classes and they have to change their shoes. So when they come to us, usually September's kind of a hot mess <laughs> with them <laughs> trying to figure out um, you know, how to change their shoes, but they need to learn how to tie. They need to learn how to put their shoes on and off by themselves. They need to learn how to put their jacket on to go home. These are all things that you wouldn't think of. If they have to go to the bathroom, they need to be able to take their leotard on and off to do those things. And these are the skills of independence that we're trying to instill in these kids. So there's so much more to dance than just, you know, putting on some music and jumping around. You know, it's really, it's, it's really a, um, a sport which fosters independence, which fosters confidence and um, just organizational skills. So many different things come out of being a dancer building our workforce of the future with the competencies that they need to be successful in the workplace. Couldn't ask for anything more than that. And yeah. you know, you're doing that here each and every day. All right, you're watching NJBI's Year the Business Owner feature on the Dance Center in South Toms River. We'll return to the conversation right after these brief words. 
The thing that makes PPAC stand apart from its competition is really around the bank's product set. That brings a business from its inception all the way to the point of where they either transfer wealth to a second generation or they end up selling the business. Quite often, a business gets started with either a home equity loan or a small business loan, and eventually the company will grow into a small business, into our mid-market space, and at one point, the owner will make a decision either to transfer the wealth to a second or third generation or sell the business. And oh, by the way, we have a wealth company that would love to manage the wealth upon it. When I look at our competition, whether they're big or small, most companies do not have that product set from beginning to end, we do. We may be a smaller bank, but we are very strong when it comes to the mid-market space and how to service it. We are made to connect. Stepping into limitless possibilities. As we create with purpose, influencing the culture as we rise. Contributing to a world of inspiration. We are Black Future Makers. Welcome back to NJBI's Mind Your Business. I'm Bob Considine. We now return to Michelle Sakurka's conversation with Sherry Dackness, owner of the Dance Center in South Toms River, as they discuss the choreography that goes into growing a small business in New Jersey. Have a look. So people seem to, again, perception and, and, and forget about this is a business, right? So you're exuding your passion, the students are learning, they're getting these great skills, they're having a good time but a business is being run behind it. So I'm gonna go back to COVID again now. Um, and you were just settling into your new space. It was a challenging time, you're building up, you've got kids virtual, you're trying to get them back in the studio. Um, dance studios were just kind of forgotten in the reopening process. Yes. And we had to put that on the radar. Yeah. So um, I think that reaching out to you and NJBIA was probably the key to having dance schools reopen. We were kind of like the forgotten child <laughs> per se. So um, we were kind of classified as gyms, which were not scheduled to open, you know, until September. So my colleagues and I got together and um, actually through uh, a person named Erwin Lawrence, who uh, owns m &I Enterprises, which is like a local dancewear company in Manalapan. He um, set up a meeting for dance, like a meeting forum on Zoom for dance studio teachers to all get together and talk about the problems that we were having. And this is all throughout the state of New Jersey. We were all on Zoom. There was probably at least 150 studio owners just talking about the problems we were going through, trying to problem solve it. And then I said, hey, let me see if we can get a lobbyist involved because we're not getting anywhere. We're helping each other, but we're still not getting to, we're, we're still not getting the assistance we need to reopen. We're not being seen for the type of business that we are. We're not just like a playtime activity kids. We are actually educators. And that education was being blocked because of COVID and our classification. So what we did was reach out to you. And um, at that point, um, you were instrumental in getting us classified out of gyms and more in the education realm. And if we had not had that happen, I think that many of the local dance studios in the area would not be functioning today. So people ask me oftentimes, you know, Michelle, what do you remember about COVID? What are some of those, you know, spots during COVID? And they say, oh my God, the one absolute story during COVID was the Dance School Coalition, right? Because I said to people, don't tick off dance school owners because you will pay the price, right? And so my gosh, Sherry, I think with your leadership, I think it was within 24 hours, 300 signatures on a petition to Governor Murphy saying, here's why we deserve to be open and here's what we are and here's what we deliver. Um, and we actually got some recognition. Which was a long time coming, I think. And I think that in that sense, COVID opened a lot of doors for us that we were actually recognized as educators, 
as opposed to yes. just a fun after school activity for people. And I think that to me, that is the key that almost sums up why we're having these discussions is that what is behind the scenes of running a business? What does it mean? What does a dance studio mean in terms of our future employment? Right? What are the challenges that you see and you face every day? And what are the perceptions that we have to dispel? And we talked about a few of those perceptions today and uh, you so succinctly explained um, why what you do is so important to our society, to our future workforce, to our economy. So Shari, you talked about how you and the school engage in community and giving back to community is so important, right? Great businesses make great communities. But I know you do that in other ways as well. Please tell me more about that. I want to talk about um, scholarships and the ability for all students of all socioeconomic classes being able to have these benefits to be able to come to dance. Um, I, every year, offer about $6,000 worth of scholarships to my current students who walk through the year, who have shown not just promise, but dedication, and who I know their families have been struggling. So we offer a scholarship program to our current dancers. But I know that there is a lot of people who would love to send their children to dance who just don't have the means. And this is especially true since COVID. Mm -hmm. um, definitely, there's a lot more people struggling to get back on their feet. And I have had definitely people have to cut back on their, their number of classes. I've had people that just can't dance anymore because they can't afford everything. And I can only help so much as an individual. So um, I do want to recognize that um, we have had some students come through us through DIFUS where um, they, have they have been sponsored, uh, which is nice. Um, we have had local churches send us scholarships, which was also really nice. Um, and all those students are still with us today um, who have started on scholarship. But we could use more assistance in that area, recognizing that dance is very important to a lot of kids. It keeps them busy. It keeps them learning life skills that they need to be valuable members of the workforce in the future. It keeps them uh, with a purpose. And there's a lot of kids this day and age who feel lost, and especially since COVID, don't feel like they have a purpose. And that is part of uh, what, what I was seeing um, was happening to some of the kids when we weren't having in-person classes. And here they have a purpose when they come in. They feel, um, they feel like they have a family their dance family in addition to their regular family. So if times are hard at home, there's not enough support at home sometimes, um, they get their support that they need here to grow and to thrive and to feel confident. And I'd like to see more students who do not have the means to access dance get that access. I think that's um, fantastic. And especially at a time of when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, what it really means is you're taking it you know, and bringing it home. Again, those boots on the ground. So if you had one ask of our decision makers in the state of New Jersey, a little more of this awareness of really what's behind a program like yours, what it takes to keep a program like yours up and running, and the type of support you could use to make sure that you could grow that for access for more? Yes, absolutely. Even like summer camps are day camps. We offer day camps like from nine to 12. If kids whose parents were working had access to those camps or a little bit more support in that, that could be part of their daycare. That could be part of some of the things that would help out those parents a little bit. Um, but right now to access that with other than scholarships that I offer um, is very difficult. Well, no, I just wanna say, Sherry, thank you for what you do not just for your students, right, but for your community um, and for those who need access to opportunities that, that you're delivering each and every day. I mean, you truly make a difference as a business owner here in the state of New Jersey. I couldn't be more thankful for what you do for, for our communities and for our economy here in the state of New Jersey. Well, thank you so much for coming here and letting me have a, a voice in what, uh, in, in what we do every single day here and showing, presenting, being able to present us as educators. Your voice matters, Sherry. Thank you. All right, thank you to Sherry Dacknes and Michelle Sikirka for that very interesting Year of the Business Owner conversation. Pivoting to another interesting take on changing dynamics of the workplace in a post-COVID world, 
at NJBIA's recently held Insights and Outlooks event, Integra CEO Rashad Bajwa gave a very interesting presentation about the tricky balance of defining work culture and productivity in the workplace. Have a look. When COVID happened, I think we presumed, or I'll speak for myself, I presumed it was because it was my first pandemic I had experienced. I don't know about you guys. But, um, so I didn't know what to expect, but I presumed we'd at some point just go back to normal. Normal. And that meant, uh, from a work point of view, we would go back to the offices that we always had. And then at some point, we got vaccines. We're like, okay, it's, it's safer. We're coming back in the office. Okay, everyone has to come back in the office three days a week. That just felt like a good number. Because five, everyone would be angry. Zero, why do we have offices? Three. Okay, everyone goes, but there's no coordination. So we have three people, or I'm sorry, three days a week, people are coming back into the office. I go into the office because I, you know, I have to lead. So I have to be there, role model. I am now going to, after two years, figure out how to put on clothes that are presentable, get in front of people, and, um, and get into meetings. Wait, but the problem is I go into the office and... Everyone I need to meet with, or not everyone, most of them, are not in the office. They're all over the country. Even the ones in the office, this wasn't their th one of their three days in the week. You know, It just wasn't coordinated. So I'm driving to the office to sit in my office to get onto Teams. And that's horrible. So we decided, let's, let's survey our folks. I have a sense of what we need for our organization, you know, just kind of how we've been running the business for 25 years. But let's get a sense from them. I feel like we're losing something. And we presumed we knew the answer about what this new world was to our culture. And, and we presumed, meaning the leadership, presumed that everyone was just yearning for the days of the past. That our culture was better when we were all in the office. And the crazy thing with the data was, that's not what our people said. Our people said different things, depending on their role. Managers all said, our culture has taken a beating, because I can't get my team together. Productivity was a coin flip. Some people were on the beach, not doing anything, because they didn't have kind of that oversight over them, but that was very few. Those are people, frankly, that were on the beach when they were sitting in a cube in the office too, mentally. <laughs> <laughs> um, most people were working more than ever. They just, if anything, the concern was the reverse. They just, they can't even turn it off. We hire good people. So managers, managers felt that that culture had taken a hit. Individual folks, they saw remote work, or rather the flexibility that we were providing them to work remotely, as a boon to culture. But what's interesting is, what do they call culture? When I say culture, I'm thinking of the integrist culture. And that means, how do we get along with each other? How do we collaborate? How do we work with each other? That's not what they define. Their definition of culture is my happiness at integrist. Which is, by the way, is fair. I can't judge them. I can't say, no, you need, to, you need to think of culture the way I do. They're going to think of culture whatever way they want to, or they will move on. <laughs> Just because of, you know, that's the workforce that we're in right now, or, or the competitive workforce that we're in. And so remote work, if we didn't force them to do something they didn't want, was flexibility. It was a benefit. Technology made our lives better or made their lives better. They're not wasting time in the car. They're not going in circles around exit 10 trying to figure out how to get onto Route 27. <laughs> They're just having breakfast, exercising, getting them however appropriate they need to be to get on a camera. <laughs> and that's pretty cool. They're saving money, they're saving time, they're happier. The culture at Integris for them is better now than it was before. And it just took a pandemic to teach, teach us that.
All right, thank you to Integra CEO Rashad Bajwar for that very interesting talk at NJBI's Insights and Outlooks event. And thank you for joining us on NJBI's Money Your Business. We'll see you next time.